Welcome to Moby Mondays. Today's Moby Monday will be branding and monetizing intellectual property rights in music, sports, film, and TV. Today's moderator is Kendall Mentor. It is Kendall Mentor is of counsel with the Entertainment, Media, and Technology Industry Group at Greenspoon Martyr LLP. He is an internationally renowned entertainment attorney with over 40 years of experience. Kendall advises creative and entrepreneurial talent on various entertainment matters, media, and intellectual property, helping his clients build and monetize their brand and protect their intellectual property. He is the author of the Music Industry Guidebook, Understanding and Negotiating 360 Ancillary Rights Deals. He is a co-founder and the inaugural executive director of Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association, also known as Beasley, and currently serves on its advisory board. He is on the board of directors of the Rhythm and Blues Foundation and is the chairman emeritus of the organization. He is a member of the board of Living Legend Foundation and serves as its general counsel and is a member of the board of directors of Sound Exchange Incorporated, the Georgia Music Partners, and the Cal Entertainment Commission. Let's welcome Kendall Mentor, and thank you. You have the floor. Thank you, Rael, and thanks to Pat Shields and Yvette Moyo for being the engine that keeps the Moby family running. And actually, it's incredible, 55, 56, weekly symposium since the pandemic has hit us. So when adversity strikes, another door opens and they have found a way to keep it flooded. So tonight, this afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of sharing the microphone, sharing the camera with three very, not only good friends, colleagues, associates, one former partner, um, but in their own spaces, individuals who have exemplified excellence in the practice of law. Um, I have Bruce Siegel, who actually is a former partner of mine as of three weeks ago uh, at Taylor English, and we'll talk about their backgrounds individually in a second. The infamous Mr. Darrell Miller, who was the founding chairman of Fox Rothschild's Entertainment and Sports Department with offices in 500,000 cities all around the world. Joined by his recent partner, Laurent Rogers is also a homeboy of mine here in Atlanta. Um, Laurent is a partner in Fox Rothschild. Um, and we'll talk about their backgrounds momentarily. Tonight, we're going to talk about branding and monetizing intellectual property. In plain English, how to make some dough in the music, film, and television and sports businesses using name and likeness. We call it intellectual property because it's protected mostly by copyright, sometimes by trademark as well, um, when you're protecting the name, the likeness, the logo, the brand. And these gentlemen are going to talk about a variety of things of interest, hopefully to each of you all, so that this afternoon, this evening's outing will be not only educational, informational, but more importantly, inspiring and empowering. That's our mission. So without further ado, Mr. Laron Rogers is a partner, as I mentioned, in the sports and the entertainment department at Fox Rothschild. Um, I love the brother because he stepped up to the plate and he is the president chairman of a family that we have known for 41 years now called Beasla for the unanointed. Beasla stands for the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association. Before joining Fox Rothschild, Laurent was the former vice chair of the entertainment media and sports group at another nation, national firm called Louis Brisbois, who had offices all around the country. He's also the president chair of the State Bar of Georgia, the entertainment and sports section. He's a co-chair of the Music Industry Relations Collective for the National Museum of African American Music, which hopefully you all are astute and up to speed and know that Nashville launched the museum not too long ago. And if you haven't been there already, please make sure you put it on your agenda and your itinerary. He's also been recognized by Billboard magazine as one of the top music lawyers in the country. He's been acknowledged in Variety and a host of other publications. Bruce Siegel, not only is he a partner, 
in the entertainment, sports, and media group in my former firm, Taylor English. But he's also, and has been for many, many years, a sports genius. He is a former uh, senior vice president oh, uh, no. general of an organization called the Collegiate Licensing Company. And in, in that capacity, he was involved for, I'm dating you, Bruce, 30 plus years in the areas of sports, collegiate athletes, licensing, branding, intellectual property protection, sponsorships, endorsements. Uh, he's received the award for excellence in advancing intellectual property by the Alabama State Bar. He's a author, so he does a lot of writing for publications and, and various journals around the country related to IP and sports. Um, he's also been acknowledged and has served as chair of the International Collegiate Licensing Association. And he's a former vice president of the state, uh, vice chair, I'm sorry, of the State Bar of Georgia, the Entertainment and Sports Law Section, which Laurent currently uh, chairs. And Bruce uh, is going to talk about a very fascinating subject in a few minutes, which all you sports buffs know that the NCAA and other sanctioning bodies have now lifted the curtain and the chains and the shackles off of college athletes so that they too can share in some of that money that's made from their name and likeness and not just the universities pocketing all the dough. Last but certainly not, you know, by no means least, is Daryl Miller one more time. Uh, Daryl, in addition to having 42 jobs, uh, not only Fox Rothschild and dealing with all of his clients and family matters, is also a former executive and leader of Beasley. Um, and, you know, he served in a, in an astute capacity for Beasley for many, many years, and we still applaud him for that. But that's small potatoes compared to being recognized by his colleagues and by the industry at large in The Hollywood Reporter, in Variety, in a national law journal by being the Entertainment Law Trailblazer of the Year. He's also been renowned and, 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 and acknowledged as one of the top 100 lawyers in the business of entertainment practice in the state of California. Now, that's a hat to wear all by itself. He's got clients everywhere. He's got clients on 911, the, the fantastic TV show, on WandaVision, World and Me. He represents everybody and anybody that you can think of from that Hollywood chair of his that deals with actors and producers and artists and directors and executives and showrunners and you know as long as they've got a talent and a check <laughs> they'll talk to daryl and daryl the job done so i'd like to get off the microphone right now because as you can see i love to talk um we're going to spend a few minutes uh, for each of our esteemed guests this evening just talking about some specifics about branding and monetizing intellectual property rights Many of you might know, and if you don't know, you've been in a hole somewhere for the last 10 years, the name Rick Ross. Well, Rick Ross is not only a household name, he's a favorite patron of his bankers. And that's uh, in, in due in large part to his lawyer, Laurent Rogers, who has helped him pioneer, expand, and propel his career, as well as his success through branding and endorsements. And it's been Laurent's tutelage, guidance, and advice that has helped Rick navigate from being an artist to being a super successful entrepreneur. So without further ado, my brother Laron, the microphone is yours, I drop it. Appreciate that, Kendall, and uh, appreciate everybody for taking time to be on the panel here today. We have, for those that don't know, everyone else that's on the panel, you have a very esteemed panel here, Not myself not included. But uh, I know Kendall wants me to talk you know, about specifically about Rick Ross, but I think you have to really look at and take a step back, right? And, and really understand what is this thing we call branding and, and you know, kind of take it down a yellow brick road. So at its, at its essence, branding is connecting um, brands, whether that's a small business in your neighborhood, whether that's a global business and connecting that brand with influencers or people who have influence and so we say what are what are people who are people that have influence well it's not what you think it is it's not only the kim kardashians of the world and the rick rosses of the world there are influencers that have great value to brands that what we call our micro influencers those can be people who have um 
25, 20,000 people following them on social media, but they're rabid fans. If they're, if you're known, if they're, if someone's known as like the eyelash guru or the lipstick guru, and every time they turn on um, their IG live or their Facebook live, or they post something on their YouTube channel, most of the people on their network tunes in, well, they're an influencer with respect to that segment of the, of the business that they're interested in. So, you know, I don't want people to think that an influencer is just one size fits all because I actually help, you know, local and regional businesses pick and choose influencers that can help propel their business uh, forward without it necessarily being a big, well-known celebrity. So I think that's one of the first things you really just need to understand. And so then, you know, when you say influence, what does that really mean? Well, it means that the person that is trying to bring eyeballs to your product or service has some engagement with the people that follow them generally on social media or has some influence over people making decisions. Um, you know, when, when I was younger, you, you used to call that, you know, oh, that's if someone told you, oh, I, I, got, I caught a sale down at the at the store, you should go cop those shoes or you should buy a shirt or, you know, you always knew that cool person who had the latest gear or the latest car or the person that had the cool watch where they were influencing. I had an uncle who was, he always had the newest and latest car. And so he was influencing me um, about my buying decisions at a later point in time because he was the cool guy. So, you know, if we just take that at its core, you know, that starts to shape our discussion as to who we select as an influencer and what value does that person bring to a brand, right? So, and I, I wanna break it down because there's a number of people who work in house, I'm sure, or who have their own businesses. And so I don't wanna just give you this superstar um, example of influencer and how, how it gets done, but I wanna try and give you some nuggets of information that you can possibly use in your, in your real life. So, from a brand's perspective, what do what do they want? They generally want a couple of things. They want to bring attention or what I generally call eyeballs to their product or service. And then not just, they don't want just people to only see it, but they want people to engage with that product and or service. And then keeping it going further, they want them to not only engage with that product or service, but they want them to convert or they want a conversion meaning i want you to buy something because at the end of the day influence is only truly influential from a brand's perspective if you've been if the public's been made aware of the product and they move all the way across the spectrum to purchasing an item and creating what we call return on investment roi profit sales because at the end of the day that's what brands want to do is they want to sell stuff or sell products and services. So as we think of this through, you know, how do brands evaluate who to engage as an influencer? Well, you know, it's, it's, that's a key component to start to have a discussion about, right? Because you want to first look at is the brand, is it a regional brand, a local brand, a national brand? Do they want to, who do they want to attract? These are the conversations you, I have with the brands that I represent. Who are you trying, what eyeballs are you trying to attract? Meaning what age demographic, socioeconomic status, um, income level, um, you know, some diversity. You know, you, you ask a number of probing questions to really drill down to who, you, who you're trying to attract. And then you start to build out who has influence over that demographic. So for instance, if you're trying to attract someone to listen to music in a, a new hip hop group, well, I doubt you would want to get me as your as your target audience, right? I love, and I love hip hop music, but I'm probably not making most people or many people uh, go and, and look and listen to the newest baby record or, you know, one of the other up and come up and, any up any up and coming artist, right? Uh, my kids don't even listen to me when I, I tell them a song is good. So I'm not the influencer in that regard, but I may be an influencer with respect to travel 
or automobiles or watches because I do love a good watch and some cool shoes, right? Some especially some sneakers. So, you know, when you start to really understand, okay, who do I want to engage? You have to figure out who has access and influence over my target market. And then, at, you know, and that doesn't have to be one person. It's a national campaign. It doesn't have to be one person. You know, oftentimes what we do with brands is we help them select influencers in a region. So we may have someone in the Southeast region, in the Western region, in the Midwest, in the Northeast, people who have really solid connections uh, in those areas. And then we start to really develop uh, a list of what, the, what does the brand want in terms of deliverables? You know, do they want that influencer to uh, to post and just make them make the public aware of a product? Um, do they want to do a television commercial? Do they want to just take a photos? And so once you start to develop and understand what the brand wants, and then we start to understand, okay, well, once you get these this content, these assets, what are you going to do with them? Are you just going to, is it going to live in internally? You're going to use it in sales brochures or internal training materials. Are you going to use it at point of sale at, at a retail location? Are you going to use it in a social media campaign? Are you going to use it on television? And the reason why we start to ask those questions is because each of those mediums have different price points. And so as we start to develop, you know, what the price point or what the deliverables are that the brand wants, and then we've selected an influencer, the likes of a Rick Ross or maybe even someone not even as big as he is. Then you start to determine and you start to figure out, OK, what does the influencer charge or what's, what makes it worth their time to attach their brand and name, image and likeness to your product? So, you know, for you know, for an, any influencer, you have to go through that process of determining what makes it worth it. Um, you know, to some influencers, especially who are just getting started, it may just be as little as free product. It may be an, an affiliate code where they get paid some 10 to 20 percent of the sales that are derived through the folks that look at their um, look, look at their influence and then um, and, and then purchase, make a purchase of the product or service. And they get a piece of that. Um, or, you know, when you start to get to a bigger level, a certain influencers who have millions of followers they want guaranteed cash and that could be on a monthly basis you could put it such that you're they get paid as certain deliverables are made and, and then if you really get to a certain level and i think this is why kendall wanted me on on this discussion is that you know i started being very intentional about seven or eight years ago with with influencers to say okay how can we really monetize your influence in creating not only a guaranteed cash flow but equity because we're building these brands and these brands are selling for multiple we call multiple x's or uh, multiple times their their revenue and so if, a, if an influencer is working with a brand and they help them go from 10 million in sales to 200 million in sales and then they they sell that company for a 5x you know that company could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a billion dollars or more, right? And so we've been very intentional about making win-win situations and creating win-win situations for both the brand and the influencer. And sometimes that means taking a little bit less money on the front end, um, sometimes not. It, it all depends. It, you know, as an influencer, you don't want to starve a new brand because um, they need cash flow to keep keep the business going and whatnot. So, you know, we just kind of look at all those different variables and really start to piece together what makes sense, what makes sense for the brand, because they have to have a win. And then what makes sense for for the influencer? And, and there is no one way to do it. You know, I've done, you know, on both sides, both the brand side and the influencer side, small influencer to very, very big influencer, small brand to very big brand. But these are the concepts that are, are very consistent throughout. So I just I wanted everyone to have you know some some sense of kind of the thought process and how you use an influencer and brands get some some value out of the influence. Thank you, Laurent. Um, Laurent, when you're representing 
you know, your, let's just call it your uh, influencer clients, how do you determine how to structure the deal in, you know, certain circumstances of fees, of royalties, back end, of equity? I mean, there's certain decisions that you make. You just can't throw everything all on the table at the same time. So how do you make that analysis? I mean, I literally go through the entire process that we, we just talked about and and I figure out, OK, I really drill down to what does the brand need to be successful? And if the brand is a new brand and they need eyeballs, well, then, OK, treat my client like a marketing expense. And what would you pay if you were using a television ad and you want to get in front of five million people on television? I would call Daryl and say, Daryl, what does that cost on television? Right. Or, or an agency. And then so you can start to get a sense of what would that what that would cost. And then if my client can put that brand in front of that many eyeballs, well, then I want to price that accordingly. Right. And then so that will give me one piece. And, and I start to build out like a matrix based on the deliverable. And then I'll, I'll sit down and say, OK, you want five posts a month. OK, my client typically gets paid. You know, I have clients that get paid anywhere from. You know, as little or little or nothing product to, you know, six figures to make one post, right? So, you know, you'd start to build that out. Well, do you really want five posts at six figures? Because this is what that'll cost. And you have to see what their budget is. They may not have that budget. And then, you know, I, I will give you a, a real life example. Um, Rick Ross just did a, a television, what well, start off as a commercial it was going to be used just on social media campaign for Wingstop. Um, and I negotiated with Wingstop. Initially, they wanted all the rights. They wanted, you know, social media. They wanted television. They wanted, you know, boards. They wanted magazine rights. I was like, no, nah, no. Nah, at this price point, you get social media. And so, you know, we did it. The, the, the ad came out fantastic. And then they're like, well, we think this will be great on television during the NBA Finals. You know what I did? I went, <laughs> now you have to come back because now you want more rights, rights that are generally more expensive and they have to come and talk to you. So, you know, but again, you have to be fair. You have to understand the economics on both sides so that you don't price your client out of a deal. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are, those are real conversations that you have to do. And it, it is much easier to get equity in a company. You mentioned equity. And it's much easier to get equity in a company that is um, younger and not as you know established. It's, it'd be much more difficult to get equity in Nike than to get you know some equity in a, a startup type of company. So you have to weigh all those things as you you know really just start to sketch out what could work and have real discussions with the brand as to what they want, what their budget is. You know because sometimes budget leads the conversation, and you know I don't care what they want afford it they can't afford it and you just try and work within a budget uh and yeah that's that's generally it perfect thank you laurent appreciate that bruce sure. we're going to flip the microphone over to you there's obviously been for all of us that are uh, into college school um, a recent explosion with the what i call the emancipation of college athletes so that now they can begin to monetize their name and likeness and it's an exciting era, an exciting opportunity, especially for, especially for folks not only on the receiving end who are on the field playing or on the court, but also on the representation and the branding side um, who can now take advantage of this new opportunity. Can you share with us that journey? Sure. Um, and uh, th thanks, Kendall. And, and thanks, Laurent. I was furiously taking notes because, you know, in the world of, of collegiate athletics, this has been... Um, a, a very eventful summer, perhaps to say the least. And, um, you know, with the opening up of the ability for the first time for uh, college student athletes to be able to exercise their in inherent rights of publicity, their right to commercially utilize their name, image, and likeness uh, in things, including licensing, sponsorships, endorsements, commercials, social media is huge. And, much of many of the opportunities that will you know be available to college athletes 
will come in the form of being social media influencers. And so um, this was a this was a tutorial, and I, I appreciate that that background. But you know, in essence, um, the you know the NCAA has had a, a very hard and fast rule, um, you know, throughout its history that is grounded in the concept of, of amateurism, leading to the conclusion that, among other things, student athletes, unlike anyone else, do not have the right to commercialize the use of their name, image, and likeness. And um, as of July 1st, you know, we're, we're just, you know, a few weeks into this, that's all, that's all changed. Um, uh, the NCAA uh, has blinked. Um, you know, for a number of reasons, you know, going back to the fall of 2019, when the state of California decided to pass a bill, and the bill said that no institution, including college, university, conference, NCAA, can limit student athletes from exercising their, their name, image, and likeness rights. On the heels of that, other states began um, to pass similar bills. Um, all of this is in the context of the NCA being sued many, many times um, and, and losing, uh, most recently in the Supreme Court, really calling into question whether the NCAA on antitrust grounds you know, has, you know, can legally um, limit compensation to student athletes that they clearly cannot in the context of um, you know, of educational related compensation, but this, um, the Supreme Court case, Austin versus the NCAA, totally calls into question whether the NCAA can regulate anything related to compensation. So between legislation, litigation, um, the, the NCAA essentially blinked and, and they formed a working group. The working group was devised to change the NCAA rules. You know, they had the opportunity to go in and, and rewrite the rules that prohibited the commercial use of name, image, and likeness. And again, you know, for the first time, you know, open that up, um, you know, with, with regulations and, and with, um, you know, a certain level of, of guidelines and, and guardrails. Um, in the wake of, of, of the activity, the NCAA, and particularly after losing in the Supreme Court and, and having serious antitrust concerns, instead of <clears throat> changing their, their rules and bylaws as was planned to have taken place in the past several months, they essentially um, punted and <clears throat> decided to, you know, for now waive, you know, not, not change their rules, but waive their rules related to name, image, and likeness such that if a state has enacted a, a law allowing for name, image, and likeness, that controls in the state. If a state, had, you know, in a state that has not enacted uh, a name, image, and likeness bill, the it's up to the university, the individual universities, to decide what their policies might look like with respect to the, you know, the, the rules related to student athletes um, being able to exercise their rights with certain basic principles, you know, number one, um, <clears throat> the colleges and universities can't themselves pay a student athlete, right? They, they can't, th there's no pay for play per se. Uh, however, they cannot prevent third parties from coming in and doing a licensing, a sponsorship or uh, an endorsement bill. And so this opens up tremendous opportunities for, uh, for college athletes. And again, you know, the, the dust has not, been completely settled by any means. Um, you know, deals are, are currently being done, but I think that a lot of, you know, corporate entities, a lot of individuals um, are, you know, kind of testing the waters. Um, it, it's sort of a, a different ball game when you're looking at, you know, what, what are the, you know, these opportunities with respect to student athletes? I mean, are there apparel deals? Um, you know, the things that immediately come to mind and one of the litigations that I was referring to uh, resulted in the the demise of the EA football um, video game, and um, um, you know because of, of litigation over that and and, and settlements, that game um, you know was set aside and and, and stopped in 2014. Um, but 
the opportunity now is to go forward with a game that could truly be a realistic game where <clears throat> student athletes, as well as the university brands, um, you know, both have the ability to, you know, to, to be compensated in, in a, in a co-branding situation, trading cards, um, um, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, you know, all, all of the, these opportunities are, are swirling around. Um, and, you know, some of the more high, high profile deals that, that have been done, um, you know, in, involve the Miami quarterback, uh, Derek King, and one of his um, players, Bubba Bolden, partnered with uh, a group to endorse uh, a moving company. Um, a lot of press was generated around um, the Fresno State University basketball players, the Cavender twins, who have a strong social media following and did deals with Boost Mobile um, and a supplement company. Coach Saban, um, you know, I guess now infamously, you know, came out in a press conference last week and suggested, uh, and I'm not sure how he, he had the, the specific information, but that the Alabama incoming quarterback, uh, Bryce Young, who hasn't taken a snap as starting quarterback yet, um, has, is close to a million dollars in endorsement money. So th th this is you know, not, not exactly creating a complete level playing field. There will be different opportunities, different levels of opportunities for different student athletes. But the one thing that is in common is that, you know, there, there, there's now the unfettered, or at least for the most part, unfettered ability to actually exercise and take advantage of these rights that have heretofore been, you know, basically denied by, by the NCAA. And so it's uh, it, it's really a, a terrific and exciting time. Again, there's still a degree of uncertainty because, as I mentioned, right now the NCAA temporarily waived its rules, and you know, and what they've really been doing is looking to Congress for a federal solution, so that we don't end up where we are now, which is basically a patchwork of different. Um, you know, different rules and regulations. You know, again, as I mentioned, if you're in a state and the state law governs and you're a university in that state, you have to be consistent with that particular state's rules. If you're a university in a state that has not passed legislation, then you can come up within certain restrictions with your, your own rules, but there's no uniformity, right? And so the idea is that if Congress were to enact a federal bill, perhaps one that as the NCAA would like, preempted, you know, all of the different state bills that could be in the offing. However, it didn't, you know, occur before the July 1 deadline. And again, the, the, the reason for the July 1 deadline is that of the states that began passing these individual laws, um, you know, freeing up student athletes and, and NIL rights, the first round of those led by Florida went into effect July 1. And so that, you know, kind of was the, um, you know, that, that was sort of the, the starting point um, for all of the activity to take place. And, you know, the reason that the NCAA really at the final hour um, decided that they couldn't or were not in a position yet to change their rules, but just, you know, kind of opened it up creating a little bit of a, of a chaotic situation, but nevertheless, an exciting one for those that get to try to work with and, and to assist um, student athletes and, and those representing student athletes and brands to, to kind of figure out uh, and, and take advantage of these newfound opportunities. Thank you, Bruce. It sounds like not only is it going to be an explosive and exciting opportunity for those folks that know how to capitalize on it, not just from the brands themselves, but also from the representatives of the athletes. Um, I think it's going to be a bonanza, um, at least for the short term, until Congress can kind of get their head wrapped around it. We know they don't move too quickly. It's kind of hard to get them to decide on anything. So it may be in this state of temporary limbo for at least the next year or two. Yeah, you know, it's the, yeah, I can't envision a scenario in which it would, you know, go the, the other way, right? I mean, you know, most of the, the, the federal bills, you know, while some have been, um, they're kind of all over the place. You've got one, the College uh, Athlete Bill of Rights, which would really, you know, open up and not only address name, image, and likeness rights, 
but also ensure health and safety and you know, start looking at, at other issues, real issues, important issues facing college athletes. Uh, then you've got, um, you know, you, you've got a, a bill regarding whether or not college you know, collegiate athletes uh, are employees. There's a federal bill that was proposed called the College Athlete Right to Organize Act. And that would provide that um, college athletes have a federal right to engage in collective bargaining. Again, you know, th these will need to be and are hopefully in the process of being reconciled in a way that will, you know, come up with, with something that, you know, can actually pass. Because I do think that there's value in, you know, having some, you know, level of harmony so that, you know, you're not dealing with issues just depending upon which school and, and, and which state. And then, you know, what if a student athlete goes from school A to B state, that there's just a, a lot of potential confusion. And, you know, I think that the, the best opportunity for, you know, daylight on the federal level, um, Senator Maria Cantwell, um, Democrat from Washington, the chairwoman of the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee, has led the effort to create a bipartisan bill. So, you know, we're watching all of this very carefully, but in the meantime, uh, you just got to, you know, look at in each instance at, okay, you know, where's the opportunity? What is the school? What is their policy? What is the state law? And go from there. Well, you know, one interesting thing on the social influencer front that I thought was a novel idea, a couple of professional teams, um, one in Florida and, you know, one in Atlanta are in the process of developing a, a social media influencer program where student athletes would be identified, they would be you know, invited to attend and participate in a game day experience and then post about it. And so um, they, you know, it's a chance to create an affinity and, and to demonstrate an affinity for the team you know, in exchange for that, the student athlete gets the experience they get money and they get some really cool licensed product. Well, it's going to be an exciting field for everybody deeply involved for a long period to come. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you. So you got next up, Mr. Daryl Miller. Um, Daryl, given your, what I call it, your uh, cross circuitry between <laughs> film, television and music, and the intersection of all three of those, as we know them as entertainment in general. But um, if you could just share with us some of your experiences, and also in particular, I'll put you on the spot without calling names, but there's one client of yours in particular out of Atlanta, whose uh, first name starts with a C and last name starts with a B, um, but he also has a nickname that starts with an L. So maybe you can just share some of those experiences about taking a personality like that across multiple sectors into what turns out, fortunately for him and for you, to be a multi-million billion dollar franchise on the screen. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, but I have to say, Kendall, only if you will allow me to trademark cross-circuitry. Uh, that is uh, <laughs> never been caught, I've never been accused of that, but uh, it actually sounds pretty cool when you think about what I do. Uh, no, it's actually great. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, Bruce and Laurent, it's actually great to be on this panel with you as well. Uh, I'm usually coming to you from my really cool office with my fancy posters behind me like Laurent's all set up. But right now, just being dedicated because Kendall reached out, I'm sitting in a hotel room basically zooming in. So uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's just still nonetheless an honor to be here. Um, yeah, you know, um, as Bruce and, and Ron pointed out with leveraging, you know, brands and leveraging name and likeness, that, that's really the core of my business. And, and you're alluding to one of my key clients who I think exemplifies um, really how to kind of leverage your name and likeness into, you know, not just necessarily deals, but I often look for opportunities beyond the deals. Uh, and just uh, to kill the suspense, it's really this young man, Chris Bridges, uh, uh, professionally known as Ludacris, I believe that you're referring to, Kendo, who's out of Atlanta, who I, um, I've been with now probably, I think we're looking at 18, 19 years of just kind of quietly 
building and leveraging his brand, creating opportunities, um, and really uh, just successfully building something that I think he'll be, you know, reaping the benefits of for a very long time. Uh, and we jokingly say, uh, I, we, I jokingly say, music I think is the smallest check he probably gets these days <laughs> because he's doing some really great things. And you know, I wish it was all about the deal making and all about the work, but I'll tell you, it's three parts about the individuals. And if you get smart, dedicated, hardworking individuals who really understand the value of their brand and understand how to build teams and build a strategy to kind of grow that brand, um, you know, that's when, you know, guys like us can kind of do what we do, uh, I think, to the fullest because you have clients that can appreciate it. But Chris Bridges, um, Ludacris, we all know him from way back from his chicken and beer record. I actually know him way back from Chris Lava Lava, you know, kind of a late night radio DJ before all of this got started. Um, is doing everything now, as we know, from opening in Fast and Furious, which has uh, just had its ninth installment of Universal's biggest franchise in the history of that uh, film studio. Uh, you've seen him on hosting things like the new Fear Factor uh, that was ultimately on television. Uh, you, we've done headphones in China, cognac in France, and all kinds of uh, uh, deals and merchandising. And most um, proudly, uh, you're going to see, it's already been announced, but you'll see this coming fall, a children's animated series called Karma's World, actually based after his daughter's name, that he, uh, Chris, built from the ground up over 12 years ago, developed, partnered with Nine Story Brown Bag. They did Doc McStuffin for Disney. And ultimately, they put it together, built it up, and sold it to Netflix. So you're going to see a brand new multicultural global children's program launched this fall uh, from network from uh, from Netflix, which will be uh, really really great. That's actually been announced, and gosh, they got Mattel involved with dolls. They've gotten uh, uh, Universal involved with music. It's it's just it's just another example of this young man understanding how to you know the power of his brand first of all and all of his audiences and kind of growing it well that's really my core business i mean at the end of the day as you said i came out of music i was in music for a long long time uh but when i came out of law school it was funny i kind of said to myself you know do i want to be the 1001st music attorney <laughs> you know or do i want to figure out a way to make sure me and all my music buddies stay friends and figure out how to grow the business and uh, I got bitten by the name and likeness bug, name, likeness, and image bug, and came west. Um, but when I came west, it really was about how to take, you know, the music brands and leverage them beyond the music world. So a lot of the music attorneys uh, that, that uh, were friends of mine, as you know, through Beasley, the Black Entertainment Lawyers Association, uh, those were my first clients and first key relationships that opened the door to a lot of uh, music brands that I helped leverage their name, likeness, and images throughout the Hollywood industry. Uh, and so back in the day, you know, uh, people from DMX to, you know, to Outkast, to Ludacris, to Master P, to Busta Rhymes, you know, these were all the artists who at the height of their careers on the music side, selling millions of dollars of records, didn't really have an appreciation for the value of independently exploiting their brands. And it was something that I was able to help them kind of understand uh, uh, and then ultimately um, uh, monetize, if you will, into multiple streams. So uh, you call it cross circuitry. I call it multiple streams of revenue. And if anybody watched me over the last few years, uh, we all humorously say that if you come to me talking about you do one thing, by the time you leave, we end up talking about at least seven things that you need to do um, because the power of leveraging your brand is the power for me to create empires and to create sustainable long-term wealth, you know, that ultimately gives you the freedom to kind of do what you want to do. Um, I also believe that in this day and age, as the paradigm is shifting in all of our industries because of technology uh, and as the consumer base, you know, are shifting, and the way that they consume our content, whether it's audio or video, uh, the way they're consuming our content is forcing us all to basically reevaluate whether or not we can build sustainable business on, businesses on one revenue stream, right? Can you just sell records and only sell records and live and maintain the same kind of lifestyle you could 15, 20, 30 years ago? And I think any professional in the business would say absolutely not, because at the end of the day, 
um, it's a much, much harder business to, to aggregate the kind of revenues that we did back in the day. Today, when that same consumer, you know, ain't, ain't going to buy a CD, they're not going to buy a record, you know, I mean, album, they're going to buy basically one record, download it, and use the rest of that money to buy a subscription to something like a Netflix, you know, go to a game and, uh, and spend their resources across a lot of different boards. So what I spend a lot of times doing with name and likeness is figuring out how my brands can meet the consumers where they are, right? Figuring out where the consumers are, we either work backwards and figure out for someone like a ludicrous, where are your consumers spending their time? Where are your consumers spending their dollars? And where are your consumers that you are not? And literally figuring out how to make sure we build you know, streams and we build connections to those consumers in those different areas. Uh, and it's really about lifestyle. Uh, and it's really about uh, experience, uh, and if you know, and it's just a natural, organic thing for him to now be doing children's animation as he has a wonderful family of kids, uh, and he's really exploring and living that part of his life and building a product now that his kids will be proud of for for a very, very long time. So, I don't see it necessarily as kind of a luxury or or something that you need to kind of figure out. I see it as a must-have if you are in the business of building entertainment. Brands, as Laurent talked about, and define them very well earlier. If you're in the business of understanding how to build a sustainable brand, you must have multiple streams of revenue. You must have an understanding, a deep understanding, uh, how to leverage that brand and create, you know, those streams uh, and to build yourself in, in, into an empire. Um, for me, an actor comes to me uh, who might be famous for their name and their likeness. I take that actor and say, just don't do the deal for acting. Let's use your name and likeness and open a couple of other deals, whether those deals are for literary book publishing, for writing, for producing, you know, for directing, you know, for touring. You know, heck, even some artists, as you see as an actor, might say, you know, like a Jennifer Lopez, I want to go sing. And then you start singing. But that's all about leveraging the brand and using that brand to just kind of open doors uh, and to find audiences where they are. Uh, we've all talked about social media platforms today. When the social media world kind of introduced itself to Hollywood, I was one of the first ones in the mix, right? And at that time, Hollywood, like everywhere else, basically says, you know, we don't want to um, even acknowledge this whole alternative platform that we don't control. But I saw it as a platform of independence. I saw it as a platform where my individuals who could control their name and likeness could actually build their own audiences and build their own networks, connect with those audiences, and then monetize those relationships uh, and build an entire new stream of revenue outside what we'll call the major Hollywood studio systems. Um, we did that. I understood it. We have done that over and over and over again. And whether you're sports players who are now beginning to understand, hey, I have a hot college basketball football or whatever player, and I have this great social media platform, if you really understand the power of that platform, you understand the power of potentially creating revenues beyond your wildest imagination. And I'm just in the business of helping people realize that, understand how to tie and get next to, to smart people like Bruce and LeBron and myself, and that to ultimately build, you know, build monetizable, sustainable businesses uh, as a result of that. Um, I'll st stop there and see if you can add, add, if you want to ask me a couple of questions. Otherwise, I'll go on and on and on and on and on. No, I appreciate it. So what I'd like to do is, uh, in the remaining time that we've got, we do have a few questions from the audience. And one of them is, how do you evaluate, value, and determine the worth of your client, who is either the athlete or the celebrity, to put into this matrix that you guys have been talking about when it comes to pricing and doing the deals with the various brands what goes into your into your process i mean i can take that um i mean i'm probably one of the rare attorneys that i represent athletes and as well as entertainers and just influencers some people you never even heard of I represent several influencers in that regard that many people in the country probably haven't heard of because they're not a household name they don't sing they don't act but they have millions of followers and true influence on 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 social media, and they make seven figures a year, right? So how we kind of come to the determination of what that's worth is, 
you know, if, if I've had a brand that's paid a certain value or a certain amount for a post or a photo shoot in the past, well, that's not my bar. You know, I try and keep, you know, you try and make that rate card no less than that. And you keep building and building uh, upon that. Um, and so if you don't have any historical thing, any metrics to go from, uh, it's a gut feeling. I mean, we've been doing, I've been doing this over 20 years. It's gut, it's value. Um, and sometimes it's just about getting a chance. So, you know, for a young influencer, it may be worth it to do it for product, just to start building the resume. As you get going, it might be worth it to do it for $5,000 a post. But then once I get $5,000 a post, I'm probably going to ask for $7,500 for the next brand that comes along or $10,000 for the next brand that comes along, if it makes sense. And then, you know, I have some clients that get paid significant six figures um, for, or more for doing it. I, I don't like doing a one-off campaign. I like to build in strategic marketing efforts, um, repeated, continuous efforts uh, to our clients because I think that it builds a better ROI for the brand that wants to use the influencer uh, because it takes just so many times to touch base with a potential customer before you get them to, to, to convert. In our business, um, it's really about the quote, Kendall. Um, you know, uh, quite a few business, you know, if, in my business is about the quotes and the real estate business is about the comparables, still the quote. You know, at the end of the day, we look at what people have made, if not, you know, themselves directly, what people like them have made. And we, you know, uh, try to do some comparables. That's kind of the first baseline. But, you know, the real fun, as Bruce and Leron probably can attest to, is when it ain't about what the baseline is, it's about the de demand and supply and what people ultimately want uh, in exchange, you know, for you to commit to do whatever they want you to do. And in those scenarios, when you have the leverage, because that's just one celebrity that they know that can bring 10 million eyeballs or the one celebrity that their, their fan base or their audience is most excited about, uh, then you have a fair amount of leverage to kind of go beyond what, you know, you may have laid me on the last deal or what, you know, they may have paid their last actor. You have that ability to kind of what I like to do is break ground, do something new and kind of, you know, cut a new path forward and perhaps even set a new standard. Right. Thank you. So you're not off the hook yet there. I've got another question from you from our audience. For folks that are in the film and television business, specifically in front of the camera, and also beyond beyond the cameras, either directors or screenwriters, what are the criteria you and Fox Rothschild use to determine whether or not to bring them into the firm? Um, you know, that's that's based on a lawyer by lawyer decision. You know, so I'll, I'll talk about mine, and since I have a partner here, he can perhaps give you a couple of insights on his. But you know, for me, um, the criteria really comes down to whether or not you have a legal matter that I can actually handle or help you with uh, right now. You know, so many people uh, want to, you know, kind of engage an attorney uh, to do what agents typically do or what, you know, managers typically do. Um, I, I'm very careful to say that, Chris, I, I negotiate primarily. So I got to, number one, have something to negotiate. And if it really is about advice, guidance, and counsel, because it's not always about the contract and there's advice, guidance, and counsel, then it's about having that business, having that product, having that goal in mind and very specifically articulated. So you find yourself in a position of wanting to pay for someone like me and the value of my time to help you give that advice, counsel, and guidance to help you grow the business. So you're never too young. You're never too early in your process. You're never too new for me to be in business with. But you got to have something that I can actually act on in order to help you and in uh, and, and, and order to what I call open a file and kind of really get things going. Uh, but it's never too soon to reach out. You know, I don't have any standards to say unless you're like already on TV, unless you're already making a million bucks, I want to talk to you. There are many of my clients last week who were driving used cars and today they're driving Ferraris. So at the end of the day, it's not a function of what you have. It's a function of where you're trying to go and the level and the level of commitment you have in my experience to get there. Oh, Kendall, I just wanted to add, you know, one of the cool things, uh, and Daryl can expound on it, is that in the making of film and television, how much the budget starts to be used to bring in influencers or, or talent that has have substantial social media following as part of the marketing spin, as you know, or, or at least in, in the equation. 
So, you know, you, you sometimes you may wonder why a certain not so real talented actor or actress is on a television show, but they have tons and tons of followers because that, t- that new television show needs eyeballs. And, and that kind of goes into the factoring of how you finance it and how you get uh, some value for your marketing buck when you, you know, for the, that, that influencer who wants to be on television. Great. Next question from the audience is a question of, um, and it could be for anybody who wants to respond. Can you identify or just share who maybe some of the leading influencer platform tech companies are that you've used to work with your clients in the development of their brands? Well, you use all of them. I mean, unfortunately, the likes of Facebook and IG aren't as good about helping the influencer monetize their brand um, as others, but it's still the biggest, right? One of the biggest. I always try and help or, or get try and get clients to steer the eyeballs to platforms that they control, that they can aggregate email addresses or zip codes or something to be able to retarget uh, or to YouTube where you can monetize it more easily. Um, Twitch is really good. I mean, they, 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 they are allowing uh, people who have a substantial social media following on Twitch to get to all their fans, whereas Facebook and IG regulated now. TikTok is real good right now. You know, all these young up and coming platforms, they don't have any regulations similar to how Facebook and IG used to not have regulations. And now Facebook and IG make you pay if you want to get to all of your all of your um, people who follow you. Great. Thank you. Last question is you all sometimes wear multiple hats. You could be lawyer, possibility of doing management job or, or, or let's just say responsibilities in coordinating deals. Sometimes it could be you know, an agent just looking for opportunities. Other times, you know, you may step out and decide to partner with your client possibly uh, in some of the deals that they get into. How do you navigate those choices? Hmm, that's, I guess I try. First of all, manager. I try never to be the manager because that's that's right. a headache that I don't want to do. I want to do legal work. That's my primary thing that I want to do is come in, add value on a deal structure and negotiate a deal because managers only have a handful of clients to, to, to manage or try and seek out opportunities. I mean, Daryl probably in similar and Bruce the same, you can't, I couldn't do that for, you know, the number of clients that I have. It just wouldn't, it just would never work. So I just try and provide good legal services that add value. Yeah, some do. I mean, you know, the rules of conflicts of interest, vary from state to state, you know, and it can be really aggressive in some state, not aggressive in other states. But, you know, in California, they're very aggressive. (laughs) And uh, just as a matter of trying to understand the lines, I'm very aggressive on myself. And like Ron, I just try to keep a a fine line. It's very difficult to kind of be in business a lot with clients. It's not, you know, unheard of, but, you know, it has to be an extremely rare situation. It's very difficult to wear multiple hats with a client because you often say it's all great when you got all those hats and it's working, but when it stops working, uh, I would bet the hat that is most likely to get you liable is the one that the client's going to pick, you know? So, you know, the standards of a manager are significantly lower than the standards of a lawyer. So at any given point, how do you determine which hat you have on? And then how can you argue with the client? No, I had my manager hat on that day. So you can't sue me for violating or not catching something as a lawyer, or I had my lawyer hat on that day. So you have to you know, understand that I was operating in that capacity, not as in your manager. Um, I, I often see that as a as a very risky, potentially lose lose situation for the individual, um, because it's inevitable that things go up and, as we all know, come back down. You just hope that you grab and still go back up, and you know, kind of keep going with the wave. But um, it's very very hard if you start from a premise of a lot of different lines that you know kind of work against you as a as a representative. So I, I'm very very, very, very cautious about that as well, because it, it can, um, it doesn't seem like it's a fair playing field when I've got all the risk and the client's got all the reward. <laughs> there are times when I put a deal together, I'm like, damn, if I was the manager, I would've got 20% of this deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we said seven, seven and a half. Yeah. So um, thank you guys. It's just a closing point. Can you uh, each just share with the audience the best, most efficient way to contact you individually should they want to follow up and engage your services and make sure you get that percentage that you're entitled to? 
Bruce, you want to jump off? Uh, how can folks get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me, um, you know, via email, via LinkedIn. Um, my my LinkedIn. Uh, I, I'm an active user on on, on LinkedIn. Um, you know, via email, it's um, b siegel at taylorenglish.com. Great. Laron, how can people yeah. get in touch with I mean, the, the best way to get in touch with me is through uh, IG. I'm real heavy on uh, IG in terms of DMs. Um, our firm website and email address at lrogers at foxrothschild.com. And or just simply call the office. You can Google us. We're readily uh, findable. <laughs> Right. Hey. Carol, how about how can they reach you? And the best way to get to me is call Kendall. Just email Kendall. <laughs> just call him. Do whatever you need to do, and he'll get to me. Uh, no, <laughs> you can actually just look up my name, D A R R E L L, middle initial D, and Google it. You pull up my firm website. You got my email address. I've got social uh, handles as well. Any of those get to me. But I can tell you, I get a lot of emails and calls. So if you want to make it special. Uh, in your subject line, put Moby, you know, and that will get me know that you actually saw what was going on here and you might get through because uh, the volume is insane. But if you uh, do something, I'll be looking out at least for the next 30 days for the Moby in the subject line, which would be my keyword to know that you are somebody coming from this wonderful uh, time. Great. And I guess I'll let go of that too and close it out. Uh, my best method is through my email. I'll probably only get a couple hundred a day. But it's uh, Kendall.Minter at GM, like General Motors Law. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this back over to the esteemed Moby. They can take us on to home. And for Bruce, for Daryl, for Laron, thank you, my brothers, for taking out some time this evening to share this incredible information, this empowerment and education with our audience. Thank you for Moby for being in our community for decades. We, we like to thank you, Kendall, because um, as Yvette said earlier, um, which was offline, Beasley inspired Moby because, you know, while the lawyers were in their panels and she was um, there, you know, just looking at, you know, doing the sales for Beasley, um, she saw an opportunity um, for marketers to deal with the business behind the entertainment industry. So we want to thank you um, specifically uh, for that inspiration. And with no further ado, um, you know, we already know that with hip hop becoming global culture, this conversation is, is extremely important. So we ask that you go and share it with your friends. If you're still listening, um, just, just let people know that Moby is bringing some of the best content um, today. Moby Mondays will be on hiatus from our live shows for the month of August and our new season will start in September. Follow us on social media uh, at MOBE Symposium on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as we'll be sharing the replay of this powerful series and some of our best of Moby Monday series in the last year that the pandemic has created. Um, you can also go directly to our Moby Symposium YouTube channel and binge watch all of the series. Have a safe summer and a fun summer. Stay safe. Uh, thank you. And we appreciate everyone that was on this panel today. Have a great day. And we'll see you on the post show. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you much. Right. Take care. Take care. Continue. <coughs> Thank you, Matt. All right. Bye. Night. Sorry. Okay.